Never bet against innovation. I'm looking at some of you, and I can see some of you already rolling your eyes. Here's another blockchain crypto guy who's going to tell me how blockchain is going to save the world and make my life so much better. I actually have a little secret to share. I, too, was a skeptic of innovation. But not of blockchain, but of the internet. I mean, this is a long time ago before the internet became ubiquitous. I was a freshman in college, and I remember going to the computer lab, and my friend Sam was sitting there staring at this green monitor. That's what they were back then, green monitors with a little blinking cursor, a green blinking cursor. I sit there and watch them. There's like 45 minutes that pass. Finally, I go up to Sam, like, Sam, what are you doing? And he said, with such enthusiasm, he turns around, John, I am on this thing called Telnet. It is a protocol that allows me to send an electronic message over this thing called the internet. We wait another 10, 15 minutes, and I'm like, what's going on, Sam? And he said, well, my friend is trying to figure out how to use Telnet. Hour passes. I finally say to Sam, Sam, have you ever heard of a phone? Sam looks in disbelief and still passionate. I walk away. I roll my eyes just like you did. And I actually say, this internet thing, it's never going to work. But little did I know, we were about to enter the age of Web 1, where browser wars are going to happen, search engine wars are going to happen. Information was actually getting digitized from analog. And by senior year, I was actually a power user. In my own dorm room, I was researching things on the internet so that I didn't have to go to the library and carry 30 books home and then cite and reference just one paragraph, one page from each of these 30 books. And then a few years later, I was reminded once again, now this time as a professional on Wall Street, never bet against innovation. It was the mid-90s. There was a company called Morgan Stanley, one of the most well-known firms. They put out this thought leadership piece, literally 100 pages. And one of the predictions on what we would be doing on the internet in about 10, 15 years was watching movies on our PC. Remember, we have just barely gone past the green screen to color screens, and the PCs were about this big, the monitors. Every smart person I knew on Wall Street dismissed this concept. They actually mocked the piece because the math did not work. Back then, if you're going to take a two-hour movie and turn it from analog to digital, it was just cost prohibitive. And then if you can actually do that and you wanted to transport it through the thin pipes, it would be about five hours later if there's no buffering. If there was buffering, you would have to start all over. And if you did finally get it to your PC, you better have extra disks because otherwise you turn your PC into a single usage case just for that movie. Never bet against innovation. And the internets continue to innovate. Today, it's a great medium of communications that's fast and cheap as well as we are in Web 2. I can text my friends via WhatsApp internationally for free. I can put a short form video on Instagram and broadcast it to thousands of people. I can even hold a town forum on Reddit and discuss what I've, whatever I want with my friends. So, what is next? Well, I've spent the last five years of my career as an operator and as a builder and as a creator. What's next is Web3. And Web3 is going to be the internet of value. It is an internet that is built on a network of blockchains. And when this is done, any asset will be issued, owned, and transferred easily. So the real question we should all be asking is, what needs to happen for the internet of value to become ubiquitous? Well, one, we need proliferation of tokenization. Tokenization is digitizing the right of ownership onto a decentralized blockchain. And when you do this, you create a unified standard to represent any disparate asset that can travel on one rail. Now, I think in five to 10 years, I'm going to make my own prediction. 
we're going to go into a part of Web3 that I call hyper tokenization, where any asset of value, anything that has an income stream or a cash flow stream associated with it will be tokenized. And this is super important because right now in the world we live in, everything is actually silo markets where there's a lot of friction because there's many intermediaries. I'll give you an example. If Dave here wanted to trade stocks with me or sell me tickets to the ball game tomorrow, those are obviously different assets, different platforms, and different intermediaries. So for the stock example, I would have to go to Schwab. Dave would have to go to Fidelity. We have to go to our respective brokers who then go to the respective custodians, who then go through the transfer agents, only to get to the market makers that take spreads on both sides of this trade before it gets to the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ where the trade actually happens. And it's not even over then. It then it has to go to the DTCC where it gets registered and cleared. I'm, I'm tired just talking about that. And that that's why today it still takes two days to settle a trade on the New York Stock Exchange. Now, on that ticket example, Dave may be using Ticketmaster, and I'm on StubHub. We may not even discover that there is a market for tomorrow's ball game. So either I or he have to change platforms to make sure this trade happens. I'm going to spare you all the details of the supply chain. Just trust me. It's complicated. It's full of friction. And we're both going to pay for it. So, when hyper-tokenization actually happens, what we're going to see is great innovators who have great imagination are going to figure out ways to create new value and new ways to distribute that value. Things that we haven't even imagined today will happen. Although it's actually beginning, there's a company called Brave. And the Brave browser or the Brave search engine actually blocks the tracking of your usage of the internet. You actually keep your privacy, and you get to own your own digital data. It gives you the option to actually opt in for monetization. So if you decide to monetize your own data, you get paid directly from the advertiser via a basic attention token. Now, did you guys ever think two years ago you can turn your searching history into an asset that has value? Probably not. But the benefits of Web3 are not just for the users. It's for the creators as well. There's a company called Audius. Audius is backed by Katy Perry, Chainsmokers, and a few well-known VCs. Now, on Audius, for those of you who don't know, it's basically the Spotify of Web3. So these artists now can actually post their songs on the platform. The listeners or the users can buy audio tokens. And with these audio tokens, they can download the songs to listen and to interact with the entertainers. The entertainers now have a direct pipeline of fan engagement. What's happened here is basically fan engagement has been tokenized and turned into an asset. And now these entertainers are able to get far bigger pie of the revenue they create than the old way where the platform and then the intermediaries and then the labels collect the bulk. Now, the benefits continue. It's not just for creators and users, for businesses as well. There are blockchains like Avalanche where there's instant finality. Instant finality is when you have instant settlement. Settlement and payment happen at the point of transaction, at the point of sale. Now, we already talked about how on the New York Stock Exchange it takes two days to settle. If I wanted to send money internationally to my friend through the SWIFT network, that probably takes about five days. And to the restaurant that I ate dinner at last night, I paid with a credit card. That merchant doesn't even get the money for 30 days, and they get to pay 2.5% of my meal for the privilege of waiting 30 days. When you have instant settlement, what you're doing is unlocking trap capital. Trap capital is effectively money in transit, waiting for counterparties to validate a transaction actually happened. 
So when in Web3, when you unlock that trap capital, you're increasing the velocity of money. Said differently, you're making money more productive. Definition of GDP is money supply times the velocity of money. So in Web3, you're increasing the velocity of money. You're actually increasing economic growth. Who wouldn't want to increase economic growth? That's a lot I just said. Now let's take a step back and think about what all this means. It is a world where, because my kids love chain smokers and I like chain smokers, I can actually go search for their next album on Brave. And by searching, I will receive Brave at the basic attention tokens and then use those basic attention tokens, move it to the Avalanche DeFi ecosystem, swap it for audio tokens, and then use those audio tokens to pay the chain smokers to listen to that song while I'm creating economic value. Who doesn't want to create economic value? I'm here to tell you, let's bet on innovation, and then let's go build the internet of value. Thank you.